welcome back to the lecture series under the department of medicine doma uh, today we have a uh, series of uh, lectures under the endocrine uh, today's lecture being approach to endocrine hypertension taken by dr uh, professor nehal thomas uh, our lectures soon will be uploaded on our department of medicine youtube website which uh, the link would have been will be given at the end of the lecture also uh, sir is a professor and head of the unit of uh, endocrinology unit 1 in uh, Christian Medical College, Vellore. So he was also the former Deputy Medical Superintendent, Vice Principal of, uh, and Associate Professor of Chitur in CMC, Chitur CMC, Vellore. So he has more than 260 indexed publications, several chapters and two books. His Google citation index is as mentioned below. And also serves in areas of interest involved pathogenesis of diabetes in India, general endocrinology. So he has given more than 20 orations as mentioned. He also has initiated multiple projects to train the medical and paramedical staff from multiple hospitals, rural hospitals specifically. Uh, he has more than 65 multinational and in-house clinical trials ongoing in diabetes mellitus. He has various uh, uh, initiated on various uh, laboratory and basic science expertise for next generation sequencing. Also, uh, so also a recipient of multiple awards. I think it's way more than this what's mentioned here. I think I should, I'm really grateful that sir has agreed to take a lecture for us, for PGs, um, uh, mainly. If any questions or doubts, please put down in your chat box towards the end of the session. Uh, sir will be available even otherwise afterwards also. Uh, thank you, sir, once again for agreeing to, for taking this lecture. Hopefully it will be very useful for all of us. Thanks, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Anju, for that uh, introduction. Uh, really honored to be invited to give this talk. And... Uh, I'll be speaking to you today about endocrine hypertension, some of our experiences from Velo, and uh, an approach towards this condition. So I would like to start by giving a big acknowledgement to my entire department. Our entire clinical experience is based on what our own department of endocrinology has worked together to do, and also our sister departments, which include surgical endocrinology, nuclear medicine, radiology, pathology and the biochemistry department. And without uh, working together, none of these uh, basic algorithms that we have worked out and the diagnoses that we have made and the treatment uh, that we have given for our patients would have never been possible. So the scheme of my talk today will include uh, an introduction and a broad differential diagnosis. Uh, then I will switch to neuroendocrine tumors, particularly talk about our experience in handling these conditions, uh, the importance of genetics in the diagnosis of these conditions, uh, hyperaldosteronism, uh, malignancies of the adrenal gland, and then a broad clinical approach to this condition. So secondary hypertension, depending where you are and what you're treating, one to 5% of patients with hypertension in the population are likely to have a condition other than systemic hypertension. Uh, and this may approach even 7 to 15% in a tertiary care center. Pheochromocytomas are one of the rarer ones, but I would like to emphasize uh, that particular condition in this particular lecture because of their vast, varied presentations, the differential diagnosis that they afford. And they constitute about one in a thousand individuals with hypertension, but this may be an underestimate when we look at the more recent uh, statistics. So let me first start by saying that hypertension of any sort should be having a physician's approach. And as physicians, we should all realize that endocrine hypertension is not the commonest cause for secondary hypertension in the population. This is a list of conditions that uh, would roughly cover a broad variety of endocrine hypertension, including that of the FIOs and the paragangliomas, the neuroendocrine tumors, primary hyperaldosteronism, and Cushing syndrome, which are the top three. And then we have uh, the other conditions at the bottom. I will not focus on these. These are enzyme, congenital enzyme defects in the adrenal gland, which uh, do not pay much importance when it comes to adult medicine but they, we do see them time to time in adults as well, 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency, 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency. And then of course the conditions wherein the clinical condition per se is so obvious that it's not a diagnostic problem. Acromegaly with uh, severe insulin resistance, which may have uh, difficult to control hypertension. Hypothyroidism, which essentially has uh, a, 
a wide pulse pressure with a high systolic and a low diastolic and a hypothyroidism wherein arterial peripheral arterial resistance is increased uh, and you can also have diastolic hypertension which may be difficult to control but as i mentioned the commonest causes for secondary hypertension are not endocrine and therefore as a physician you need to think about the common causes first and this is chronic renal failure uh, sudden acute hypertension please think about glomerulonephritis and a cost effective test in doing a urine analysis is so very important vesicourethral reflux wherein children may have problems and going into adults they may have back pressure changes which can also result in uh, a renin mediated form of hypertension and of course renal artery stenosis which has two peaks one in early adulthood and the second uh, when there is atherosclerotic disease uh, after the age of 60 <clears throat> and so on and so forth of course you have coarctation of the aorta uh, raised intracranial tension and porphyrias which could present with uh, episodic hypertension with the other symptoms of porphyria which may of course coincide altered sensorium psychiatric presentations and uh, associated hyponatremia so i shall start first with the i am going to focus entirely on the endocrine causes and the three which i mentioned on the top and i'll be talking first about the neuroendocrine tumors and this will be entirely a case based discussion and uh, uh, i'd be very happy to answer questions at the end of this all now the first important work which were done from cmc velo was by my teacher uh, professor sheshadri and this is the first indian series on pheochromocyte cytoma which was published way back in 19 98 uh, and subsequently there is a publication uh, from about a decade back when we validated our metanephrine studies as well my colleague uh, who is now uh, retired from the department uh, professor simon rajaratnam did some wonderful work along with uh, our colleague in the department of molecular pathology dr reka pai on looking at uh, mutational analysis in patients with uh, pheochromocytomas so i shall first start with the role of genetic testing in pheos and paragangliomas and we do genetic testing now routinely because it is really important to understand the genetic makeup of these patients paragangliomas patients who have extra adrenal uh, neuroendocrine tumors pheos bilateral pheochromocytomas unilateral pheos with a family history of either a pheo or a paragangioma unilateral adrenal pheos at an early on age of onset that is less than 45 years or any other clinical finding suggestive of one of the associated syndromic disorders and i shall go into them for example multiple endocrine neoplasia type b may have marfanoid features uh, or a patient who has a renal cell carcinoma with an adrenal tumor you should consider a possibility of von hippel lindau syndrome so this is a 44 year old gentleman who came with a history of high blood pressure uh, severe hypertension for 2 years and a recent onset of diabetes you can see that his uh, baseline tests uh, urinary metanephrines and normetanephrines were actually unremarkable they were normal and uh, the serum calcium was elevated at 11 mg per deciliter uh, along with the parathyroid hormone elevation this was incidentally checked and then we checked the pth and you can see therefore a patient who has uh accelerated hypertension with uh hypercalcemia well you might think of hypoparathyroidism per se uh the hypercalcemia itself has its own mechanisms in stimulating uh diastolic hypertension but more important to think when you have this severe onset of hypertension uh is that thinking of uh, an adrenal tumor and we had done a ct scan which showed a right adrenal mass and uh because of this associated hyperparathyroidism we thought this is possibly men or multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2a and therefore we thought that perhaps this bilateral disease and indeed this is a metaido benzyl guanidine scan the commonly used isotope scan which shows bilateral disease over here a larger tumor on the left side and a smaller one on the right so basically uh, these are the findings fio should be suspected in patients who have uh suspected underlying adrenal disease or those who have accelerated hypertension with another syndromic feature like men2 
even if the catecholamines are normal, we should think that this is uh, a fear chromocytoma, even if the catecholamines are normal. And therefore, the imaging overrides the biochemical testing over here. And very often, this is a pre-biochemical phase or that the catecholamine secretion may be intermittent. Uh, this is the ultrasound of the neck showing evidence of the parathyroid adenoma. And uh, after establishing the diagnosis, he had a bilateral adrenalectomy. He had a right parathyroidectomy done as well. And uh, indeed, uh, when one has ME and 2A, one should suspect a possibility of coinciding medullary thyroid cancer. And uh, the thyroid was bulky and it showed evidence of malignancy. So he had a total thyroidectomy done. And this is ME and 2A and he's doing well on follow-up. Now, the important thing here is that since you've made a clinical diagnosis of MEN2A, you should establish it genetically and you should do predictive screening in the other family members. That's really important because if you diagnose medullary thyroid cancer in one family member, then you should be able to diagnose it in younger people who have the problem because prophylactic thyroidectomy is the treatment of choice for medullary thyroid cancer and therefore this should be done. Children less than the age of five or five to 10 should be actually having a, a thyroidectomy prophylactically if they are positive. And that's what's being done at this point of time. So over here, uh, this is a publication in clinical endocrinology a few years back, which looked at our profile of uh, genetic testing. And it's not different from the rest of the world, wherein uh, MEN2 uh, and medullary thyroid cancer had a profile of, uh, of uh, which was similar to the, uh, the Western population. So this identification, therefore, as I mentioned, helps in prophylactic thyroidectomy, screening of uh, siblings and children, presence of MEN2 when non-syndromic, and also predicting the severity of the disease. Certain uh, mutations, particularly the one in codon 918, is known to have a more rapidly progressive disease. So it tells you about the course of the disease and helps the physician and the surgeon plan the treatment better. An 18-year-old girl, a lady rather, presented with uh, severe hypertension for three months and had elevated uh, normetinephrine levels. And here is a CT scan, once again, showing bilateral tumors. Now, let me just allude to some of the findings on a CT scan over here. Uh, FIOs, uh, by and large, are very vascular lesions. And so uh, they will usually blush on, uh, uh, on the arterial phase. And that's what you see over here is that the tumor takes up contrast in the arterial phase. And also, in addition to that, uh, on imaging in the plane phase, they have a higher Hounsfield density. As opposed to adenomas and Crohn's syndrome, which are high fat content, they have a Hounsfield density, which is usually less than 10. And these have a higher Hounsfield density. So you can see over here bilateral adrenal tumors. Uh, that's the right one in this particular cut, which is obvious. And uh, in addition to that, what the CT scan picked up over here is a pancreatic vascular lesion in the pancreas. So when you have a pancreatic tumor along with FIOS, you should think of a condition called von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. Once again, a genetic condition, uh, which is characterized uh, classically by having uh, hemangiomas in the fundus, maybe uh, pheochromocytomas, which are usually bilateral, pancreatic uh, uh, islet cell tumors, and also in some kinds of uh, von Hippel lindo there are three types, you may have renal cell carcinoma as well. And of course, these may present at different times, uh, points of time in the patient's life. So here again, the MIBG scan showing an increased uptake. And so now once again, uh, the surgeon's ingenuity also comes into play in handling these people. If you have two uh, adrenal tumors, one on both sides, you'd think, okay, fine, we need to knock off both these tumors. And therefore, the patient would have to be lifelong dependent on glucocorticoids, uh, prednisolone or hydrocortisone orally for life, along with glucocorticone for the mineralocorticoid replacement. But the surgeons have actually devised what is calling a cortical sparing adrenalectomy. So they take off one adrenal, and if it's possible, they try and carve out the tumor and leave the cortex on one side. And so this patient has had an extensive surgery uh, with a cortical sparing adenectomy, and therefore this patient need not have either glucocorticoid or mineralocorticoid replacement uh, orally on a long-term basis. Having said that, as a precautionary measure in case of stress, vomiting, diarrhea, or fever, 
we still advocate hydrocortisone therapy for them. So the histopathology in FIOS is not necessarily a predictor of malignancy. This is one thing about generally speaking, and I, uh, God forbid if I'm being too general about it, but uh, neuroendocrine tumors tend to be proliferative. They have uh, a lot of mitochondria. Uh, they are more vascular. And so nuclear pleomorphism may be seen in these patients. So, okay, for some odd reason, uh, the color on the slide has vanished, but essentially pleomorphism is not uh, is not a feature of malignancy over here. There may be mitotic figures, etc. You need to have capsular and vascular invasion to say this is a malignancy. So once again, the patient has done well postoperatively the cortisol, and we have characterized Waldheim-Lindau on the syndrome. This patient on the fundus examination did not have uh, uh, any hemangiomas in the fundus. So. The clinician's ability to examine the patient is really important. When you see a patient with a few, look at the fundus for hypertensive changes, but you also look for angiomas, which help in uh, making an early diagnosis of von Hippel-Lindau's syndrome. And uh, this is the mechanism. Basically, uh, when you have uh, these mutations, basically you have this hypoxic ischemic factor, alpha, uh, one alpha and two alpha, and these are factors which uh, accumulate and increase angiogenesis and therefore multiple vascular tumors develop in the body, including uh, the vascular growth in the fun, optic fun, op, in the optic uh, in the eye. And uh, there's also a stimulation of growth as well because of the increased glucose transport into the tumors. So when you have a patient who has VHL, one uh, Lindau syndrome, you need to follow them up measure the metanephrines, non-metanephrines on an annual basis. You need to also get periodic, they're prone for uh, hemangiomas in the neuraxis. Particularly the classical example is the cerebellar hemangioblastomas, uh, wherein we have found patients who come to the neurosurgeons with vascular lesions, and then they're taken up for surgery and they have a hypertensive crisis. So now the neurosurgeons are very careful. If they have a vascular looking lesion in the neuraxis or in the cerebellum in particular, they always do catecholamine screening in, as a routine and do an ultrasound of the abdomen to look at the adrenals to see the fears. And so you operate the fears first, and then you think about tackling the uh, brain tumor in those situations. So periodic uh, MRI of the brain, spinal cord, CT is required uh, initially annually, and then if they are stable, once in three years. And this really reduces the morbidity and mortality in these patients. So... We have an algorithm for management of pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. Uh, now, someone who is astute will tell me, why aren't you measuring plasma metanephrine levels? And there's a reason for that. We initially were measuring urine vanil mandelic acid. That's an old-fashioned test, which we were doing till maybe about 15 years back. And then we upgraded to the uh, metanephrines, the urinary metanephrines, because they are sensitive, more sensitive and more specific than vandal mandelic acid. But there's a trade-off and the price went up by around two and a half times in doing this test. Now, if I want to use a plasma antinephrine, I need to use a, 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 a LCMS measurement and I would, uh, the price would go up by an extra five times. And therefore, to practice cost-effective medicine, which may, and in this sort of a situation, you may have a marginal benefit in measuring the plasma antinephrine. You're not doing it within our institution as a routine clinical basis. And that is the reason. So we have reasons for it, not that we can't do it. And I'm sure biochemistry department can set it up anytime in the future. So uh, a CT scan is really the imaging test for FIOs and paragliomas. MRIs are only required in certain situations where you're thinking of uh, local spread, malignancy, uh, pelvic involvement, etc. MRIs have much more of a role over there. Uh, by and large, the classical adrenal imaging with a CT scan uh, uh, is, is all that is required. Now, in some patients, you won't want to look for smaller lesions or extra adrenal lesions, and you will do isotope scan. So the meta hydrobenzyl guanidine is the time-tested scan. The first place to do it in India was actually the nuclear medicine department here in CMC way back in 1993. And uh, now, of course, you have PET scans and you have uh, DOTA PET scans, which have a... Uh, more uh, a specificity for neuroendocrine tumors. But uh, sometimes things are mutually exclusive. In fact, the MIBT scans pick up 
some tumors, Dota pets becomes others. The MIBG is cheaper than the Dota pet. Uh, so, and the other thing is from a perspective of treatment, eventually, if you have metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, particularly the fewers, the MIBG ablation therapy is actually cheaper than the lutetium, which you give for the Dota pet. So when you're practicing cost-effective medicine, once again, you need to take these uh, facts in, into account, factors into account. So the unique thing about uh, fios and paragangliomas is probably one of the only forms of hypertension where you load the patient with fluid and with salt. It's one of the few conditions where you need to give tons of water, four liters of fluid for about 10 days, also load them with lots of salt, 12 to 16 grams of salt. And the reason for that is because you're giving alpha blockade to reduce the blood pressure, you're vasodilating them. And once you take the tumor off, pop, the blood pressure will actually drop after surgery because the catecholamines are suddenly withdrawn and you go into a, a vasodilated phase and the danger is you can hypotense after surgery. So preoperatively, you need to load them with fluid and salt. You alpha block them. We use uh, uh, the drug of the, the medication of choice is phenoxybenzamine. But uh, having said that, once again, when we talk about cost-effective medicine, prazosin is just as good for most of our patients. We rarely ever end up using phenoxybenzamine, which is far more expensive. And we also are very careful about you. When we know it's a fear or a paraganglion, we are very careful about beta blockade usage. Uh, we do use it because they eventually develop uh, tachycardia when you're using alpha blockade. The acetate may have a resisting tachycardia when they, when they have catecholamine excess, but you add more alpha blockade and they will have worsening tachycardia. And then in about seven to 10 days, you add on the beta blockade to uh, control the heart rate. Otherwise, uh, with the tachycardia per se, they may have uh, increased arthmogenicity uh, when, uh, when they're being intubated or being anesthetized. And, but of course, our anesthetists are fantastic and know how to control these issues as well. So uh, when they are large left-sided tumors, the spleen may get nicked or may have to be taken off if it's adherent, and therefore we give prophylactic pneumo vaccination as well. So what about calcium channel blockers? There are some amazing studies which are done in Europe and in, in, West, in Germany, uh, wherein calcium channel blockers have been used as alternatives to alpha blockade. Well, we don't quite believe in that. And uh, we follow alpha block uh, uh, because we think this is physiologically appropriate and we do this. So surgery under anesthesia, and of course, nowadays, uh, I think most people use these anesthetic agents, uh, but the old fashioned ones, which no one uses anymore, uh, that's an old story. Uh, things like, you know, obviously nitrous oxide and halothane were much more stimulatory for catecholamines and the risk of therefore developing a catecholamine excess during the time of surgery was much greater. And so these are things which are less provocative. Now, by and large, uh, as I said, our endocrine surgeons are absolutely fantastic. They can take off almost anything uh, in the retroperitoneal area through laparoscopy. So even if they are big tumors, uh, they do them pretty well. Uh, well. Of course, if they are adherent and if they are multiple lesions and paragangliomas, then of course, uh, they go uh, through open surgical methods. Here's a 35-year-old female who came with diabetes, hypertension, progressive weight loss for three months. And uh, if you look at the pedigree chart, now this is so important. Uh, in uh, disorders where you think there may be even the remotest chance of a genetic condition, sitting down, taking a good history, drawing a great pedigree chart is really important. And you can see over here, there'll be some vague history of someone dying of a, a malignant tumor. You can see there the father died of some liver tumor and uh, somebody else died of a cardiac death. Another uncle, paternal uncle who died of a, a cardiac death as well, sudden cardiac death. So you take that with great importance. Now uh, here, once again, you can see there's a large uh, extra adrenal tumor, vascular, once again, extremely vascular lesion. Uh, it's retroperitoneal, it's almost six centimeters in size. And uh, while doing the CT scan, we also noticed a, a lytic lesion in the pelvis. So this patient has a paraganglioma along with metastasis to the uh, bones. So <coughs> large malignant tumor invading uh, the right lobe of the liver. It was excised and blocked by open anterior approach. 
And now when you have an aggressive tumor like this, which is spreading all over the body, uh, the succinyl dehydrogenase B mutations are important to think about. So this is another group of uh, uh, paraganglioma syndromes, succinyl dehydrogenase A, B, and C, which are associated with, uh, with, um, with uh, paragangliomas. And B is a much more aggressive malignant tumor. You can say B for bad, that's how we remember it. And uh, here you can see our surgeons once again doing an expeditious surgery and removing the tumor and block. So here we have picked up the succinyl dehydrogenase B mutation. Once again, really important. And if you remember that pedigree chart, which I'd shown you, uh, uh, it helps therefore for identifying other family members early. Currently the patient, uh, the patient is on chemotherapy and doing pretty well. So this is, uh, I mentioned to you that uh, there are various ways we can treat these tumors. Now, if they are metastatic, uh, and they have a very high mitotic index, uh, we can think about um, of chemotherapy. But of course, for neuroendocrine tumors, the other thing is giving isotope ablation. So you can give MIBG therapy or lutetium therapy, depending on what. But these are from some of the chemotherapeutic agents here, which are now used for the STHB mutations. Uh, mTOR uh, 1 and 2 inhibitors like rapo, my, rapamycin ev evolutinus have given very promising responses. And in addition, you have the heat shock protein 90 inhibitors and HIF inhibitors uh, and the AKT inhibitors, which have also been tried out. So uh, genetic testing, well, Sanger sequencing, you need to look for each one individually. But then, of course, if you have next generation sequencing, you can put all these genes together and in one panel shoot and make your genetic diagnosis. So... Uh, this is the algorithm which is used when you have Sanger sequencing available. And like NGS, of course, you can put all the genes together and uh, look for all the mutations simultaneously. 31-year-old gentleman, eldest sibling, presented with four months of history of recurrent episodic palpitation, flushing, and headache. Now, this flushing business we'll come to a little later uh, because it's a very important differential diagnosis for other conditions when you have palpitations and flushing. And we'll come to that DD again. And therefore, as physicians, it's important to remember that. So the systolic of 160 uh, and a diastolic of 120 had swellings in the neck as well. And uh, here the norometinephrines are high. Uh, you can see over here that there's a vascular tumor on the right side, which is very large, enhancing the arterial phase. And the MRI of the neck shows these two very large lesions, these are carotid body tumors. Now, a patient may come with just carotid body tumors in this family without any hypertension. So it's important, therefore, uh, if you have vascular lesions in the neck, think about carotid body tumors as a presenting feature of these neuroendocrine tumors. So he's had laparotomy and three lesions are excised and he had a normal MIBG in 2013. And we are following them up periodically. This is the 2015 DOTA PET scan, which uh, shows uh, increased uptake in the neck. So there's obviously a recurrence. And he had lutetium treatment with which there is regression. So these patients need lifelong follow-up. Now, the important thing is to understand that by and large with neuroendocrine tumors, and that holds good for fios and palagram myomas, even though they're metastatic and malignant, they do a lot better than many of the adenocarcinomas that you see with uh, non-neuroendocrine -neuro tumors. So these patients can live for many years with their metastatic disease. So you, you can give them a lot of hope for what they are uh, for a long period of time. Even if there's no total cure or remission, they can live with it. So the PET scans, as I mentioned over here, the fluorodopamine and the MIBG scintigraphy are available. Uh, and these modalities confirm the tumors with 100% specificity. Now, the STHB mutations, uh, the FTG PET is more sensitive. So because of their probably poorer proliferative index and they are not as well differentiated, the FDG PET is better than the uh, fluorodopa scans. Okay. 
So here is the second sibling, once again, in that family, which I was talking to you, a 28 year old lady, normal till the age of 21 years, had pregnancy, hypertension, and the eight month of gestation, had a cesarean section, had a hypertensive crisis during surgery. Uh, then later on, well, touch wood, nothing serious happened to her at that time. And bilateral neck swellings. I think they probably thought that they were dealing with eclampsia at that point of time. And so, you know, when you think that something is, a, something is eclampsia as an obstetrician, obviously there could be something else lurking around once in a way, and therefore you need to be cautious. She noted a neck swelling, operated on the left side, then had a hypertensive crisis and an intracranial bleed. As you can see here, once again, she was lucky to uh, get away with this, had a surgery on, on the neck. And so basically, uh, this is the work once again done by my colleagues on uh, uh, character body tumors, which I'd like to highlight. Okay, so four to 12% of sporadic fewers and up to 50% of familial fewers have STHD or STHB mutations. And the STHB mutations predispose to mainly extra adrenal pheochromocytomas with a highly malignant potential, as I mentioned, B for bad. And the STHD are with multifocal parasympathetic head and neck paragangliomas with benign extra adrenal and adrenal pheochromocytomas. So here we have a protocol once again. We need to once again do frequent imaging with MRI skull base and neck or CT thorax, retroperitoneum and pelvis. Once again, depending on how severe the disease, uh, need to repeat these once in two years or so. 25 year old lady comes at the age of 15 with right hemiparesis following an intracranial bleed. Once again, for whatever reason, she was not investigated where she had been initially seen and she got married, conceived and had an uneventful pregnancy. Then she started complaining of headache with high blood pressure profuse sweating and worsening of symptoms after using the toilet. <clears throat> now, the blood pressure was 130 by 100 and this increased to 180 by 110 following micturition and she had grade 4 power on the right side. So she had uh, uh, grade 3 hypertensive changes in the fundus indicating that her hypertension was of long duration and significant uh, severity and had LVH and the norm antinephrines were elevated. So you can actually look at this history and it's a classic by itself, micturition syncope, and she has a bladder pheochromocytoma, uh, as you can see, proven here on the MRI. And that's the MIBG scan. Now these MIBG scans, the bladder will normally have a residue of MIBG sitting over there after uh, it's injected and it will still be there. So what you need to do is wait for it to wash out for more than three to four days and the bladder wall will take up the isotope as in this case. Otherwise, even a per normal person can have MIBG sitting in the bladder. So you need to wait for a washout for more than three days or four days to see this. So she underwent a partial cystectomy and she's done extremely well post-operatively. Once again, I'm highlighting a lot of patients who are young do not have that appropriate workup. Uh, and it is very important to look for these conditions. Uh, this patient actually, uh, once again, escaped uh, a problem going through a delivery with a, a, a paraganglia sitting in the body, pressing with the fetus present, pressing on the bladder is rather, you know, very, very fortunate. So the biopsy shows uh, uh, this tumor, which is uh, an extra grand, uh, extra adrenal paraganglioma. And uh, you can see over here, this is a chromaffin stain of the tissue, uh, which uh, shows uh, dense uptake of chromaffin. Once again, we have had an experience with this condition and micturition syncope, interestingly in our series was an uncommon presentation. Okay, so let's uh, wind up this part of the talk by looking at the differential diagnosis of yours. As physicians, remember there's a big differential diagnosis and like, you know, the most, one of the most difficult or troubling uh, differential diagnosis is syncope. As a physician, you know how difficult that is to evaluate even it's awfully common. Now, palpitations with sweating or with high blood pressure can mean a lot of things. It could mean just simple anxiety and panic attacks, hyperthyroidism, but it's more kind of sustained symptoms, not intermittent, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, 
menopause menopause can present with pretty drastic symptoms at times there are women who can come with hot flushes with uh, sudden rise in blood pressure and can be extremely disabling and frightening for them uh migraine can come with headache and you may have a diastolic blood pressure which is associated high with the migraineous headache at the same time and how about hypoglycemia which actually has all the features because when you have hypoglycemia the catecholamines go up and you can develop everything there once again the palpitations the sweats and the rise in diastolic blood pressure and the others of course are less common but remember there are certain medications which can also precipitate these symptoms like tricyclic uh, which are used for treating depression and of course some uh, drugs of uh, which have been abused can also cause similar symptoms in summary uh, always attempt to look for a syndrome pick association in fevers and paragangliomas genetic testing is mandated for at risk siblings isotope scans with mibg and doter pet scans are mandated and we need to give isotope ablation uh, in certain patients uh, in a smaller number but it's useful and of course multidisciplinary therapy a few or paragangliomas should, should be handled in a specialist center on a long term basis so let's talk about the next uh, condition which is hyperaldosteronism and this is a far commoner condition than fevers or or, or uh, paragangliomas and should be looked at in your clinic even as a secondary care physician so this is uh, a diagram which shows you uh, the kidney and its production of renin and uh, this relationship basically between renin and aldosterone so you have a production of renin and the angiotensin system is activated and uh, basically you have an independent production of aldosterone which leads to increased potassium excretion and uh, uh, sodium preservation in the body so this was a 32 year old lady who came with uh, uh, high blood pressure and she also had episodes of flaccid quadriparesis for 6 years uh known hypertensive for 3 years and uh, basically she was on uh, some medications for control of her blood pressure once again uncontrolled hypertension for a while and she had a loud uh, a2 indicating lbh and proximal myopathy which was profound so her sodium was borderline high and the potassium was low with the uh, alkalosis so hypokalemic alkalosis the commonest cause is of course uh, a patient on a diuretic with hypertension more common than anything else and then of course you need to rule out the other conditions where you have hypokalemic alkalosis with hypertension and this includes uh, hyperaldosteronism that is con syndrome and uh, cushing syndrome so the patient did not have any cushingoid features but that should be kept in mind and the creatinine was normal and the ecg had left ventricular hypertrophy and u waves so you can see over here that the ct scan of the abdomen shows uh, a lipid rich lesion has a low hounsfield density of less than 10 uh, in most of these aldosterone producing adenomas are lipid rich about 80% are about uh, 15 to 20% are not but uh, by this is the classic where you can have a lipid rich adenoma which produces aldosterone and these lesions are generally on the smaller side less than 2.5 cm this is in contrast to the fios which i told you which are larger and much more vascular in their appearance so when we investigated we found that the aldosterone levels were elevated and the renin levels were suppressed so hyporenemic hypoaldosterone and uh, it's a common occur occurrence and very often these conditions can be missed in milder disease periodic paralysis is a classic symptom in 50% of patients who have aldosterone producing adenoma so always try and ask for that history do you feel suddenly weak during it may not be a quadri a plegia but it could be a just a generalized quadri paralysis i can uh, you know suddenly feel weak during the course of the day or on an extremely warm or sweaty day i might uh, feel like that so less severe organ damage than pheochromocytoma and the treatment is involving uh, spironolactone uh, is the drug of choice that you would actually use 
preoperatively. Calcium channel blockers work pretty well because they have an independent action on the aldosterone effect itself. And of course, ACE and ARB make common sense to use because they are potassium uh, spare, they, they are potassium sparing in their effect in addition. Now here the tumors are small and are generally very straightforward for both the anesthetist and the surgeon to handle in the perioperative phase. So we frequently do, uh, um, uh, in all cases, by and large, laparoscopic posterior approaches, what is performed over here. Yeah, so this I would like to highlight as a truly visionary article. When Dr. Jerome Kahn, whom the syndrome is named after, wrote this article, and you obviously don't have the time to actually skim through the just 400 words in the beginning of the article. It was a real vision. It tells us how much he actually understood about the condition before a lot of other people 50 years figured it out. He mentioned that primary hyperaldosteronism may exist for many years before potassium deficiency is picked up. And therefore, normokalemic hyperaldosteronism, in fact, can occur. And that was thought about only somewhere in the 1990s as an important condition, but he actually thought about that. A large proportion of patients with essential hypertension have primary hyperaldosteronism. He had a referral bias. He said maybe 20 to 30 percent of them have it. Well, may not be that high, but there is a good number of refractory hypertension, which may be normokalemic hyperaldosteronism. Incidental cortical adenomas without hypertension physically appear the same. So if you have a patient uh, who has, this was probably done through uh, post-mortem studies and other methods. Now, of course, we have imaging, which picks up incidental nomas, but cortical adenomas may be lipoid rich and are incidental nomas as well. And he noted all this way back in the 1950s when there was no imaging available or even measuring renin or plasma renin activity or aldosterone was actually very difficult to do. So, but the causes for hyperaldosteronism, let me highlight. We think of it as a tumor, which is unilateral, lipoid rich. But the commonest cause for hyperaldosteronism has been bilateral idiopathic hyperaldosteronism. It's the most common cause, 60 to 70 percent of cases of primary hyperaldosteronism. A unilateral adenoma or aldosterone producing adenoma in 30 to 40 percent of cases with primary hyperaldosteronism. And in these patients, a somatic mutation or the KCNJ5 gene is seen in about 40% of cases. There are other rarer causes. So you can have unilateral adrenal hyperplasia, uh, which has a sim similar clinical presentation and outcome to aldosterone producing adenomas. Fili familial forms of hyperaldosteronism with germline mutations once again in KCNJ and CACNA1D. Uh, and aldosterone producing adrenocortical carcinomas may also be there. Now, malignancies of the adrenal cortex are usually large lesions. They are more than 4.5 centimeters in size. Uh, a good number of them may produce just DHAs, dehydroepiandosterone sulfate, a bit of testosterone, in, which can be detected in females. And a very small proportion, maybe about 10% may produce aldosterone. And if they do produce aldosterone, the prognosis is actually much worse uh, than even the regular adrenocortical carcinomas. So, highlighting the importance, primary hyperaldosteronism is responsible for 5 to 13% of causes of hypertension and makes up about 0.6% of adrenal incident lomas. Its prevalence is 3% of hypertension in primary care setting and 39% of patients with res resistant hypertension. So even if the potassium is not low, when you have someone who comes with a hypertensive crisis, right, or accelerated severe hypertension, you should check a renin and aldosterone level. Six to 10% of hypertension in patients for referred for difficult to manage hypertension should, will probably have this condition. And the aldosterone renin ratio is a, is a useful screening tool tool, but can very often, uh, there can be false results in this situation. So the prevalence of primary hypertension averaged around 6% of patients with hypertension in this situation. So 
hypokalemia is present in 40% if you take a big series published more recently in the last 10 years. And uh, idiopathic hyperaldosteronism has less, that is the bilateral hyperplasia has less hypokalemia than the those who have the adenomas. Lack of edema is a conspicuous feature of patients who have hyperaldosteronism. Still holds very good as a clinical sign. And this is due to the so-called aldosterone escape uh, phenomena, wherein the ENP levels are elevated, atrial natriuretic pep peptide levels are elevated, and metabolic alkalosis is prominent, hypomagnesiumia may be present and is mild. This is also due to the effect of aldosterone per se, and hypernatremia may not be present. You may have a high normal sodium, never low normal, high normal, or just and this is once again, the lack of hypernatremia is due to the aldosterone escape phenomenon. So there are problems with the aldosterone renin ratio, false positive in about 50%. Uh, I think you should leave that to the endocrinologist to make a decision as to how good or bad the assay is. Uh, and uh, the ratio interpretation can vary uh, depending on the assay kit. Uh, PRA levels can be low, plasma renin activity levels can be low in about 10 30% of hypertensive individuals, therefore leading to a false elevation of aldosterone ratio. And the low limit of PRA changes from 0.6 nanogram per ml to as low as 0.1. So there's a lot of variability over here. And this adds to the confusion in these situations. So if you have a difficult to control hypertension and you've investigated thoroughly, uh, one of the good ideas is why not try spironolactone at the end of the day? Uh, some trend towards this difference. And if spironolactone works, you can probably be certain that there is a remediable form of hyperalstronum lurking in these kind of patients. Finally, a little bit about cortical malignancies. And once again, with a little example, this is a 30-year-old lady who was pregnant, had headache, dizziness and loin pain for two months. And uh, she had hypertension, which is detected. Uh, this is, remember, 18 weeks of gestation, uh, rather early, no palpitations, visual disturbance or syncope, and no proximal myopathy or easy reducibility. So a good physical examination to look for whatever cause that you might be thinking about. And uh, she did not have Cushingite features. She had uh, pedal edema, which could very well have been during her pregnancy period. And she had a bimanually palpable loin mass. Her blood pressure was high. There was no virilization. You can see over here that uh, she has uh, a hypokalemic alkalosis, which indicates that with a, with a palpable mass, that it's producing either a lot of cortisol or a lot of aldosterone, most likely. So this is the cortisol check. But during pregnancy, cortisol levels can be falsely elevated. Okay, there's CRH and ACTH being produced by the placenta and that can stimulate the adrenals to produce cortisol. So, and even the dexamethasone suppression test, even though it is not suppressed, need not be reliable. So also with aldosterone levels, the DHS levels were not elevated. And this is a few years back, maybe more than a decade and a half. So the vinyl mandelic acid levels were not, uh, were very low. So she has once again, chronic hypertension as from the LVH on the ECG and an ultrasound shows a large tumor. And these are the investigations once again. Sorry. Yeah. So the differentials were maybe a cortisol producing adrenal tumor, maybe an adrenocortical carcinoma, looking at the size, bimanally palpable, or a few as a possibility because of the severity of the hypertension. So she was on these medications. And she had a spontaneous miscarriage. And after that, we repeated a dexa, post dexa cortisol and found it was elevated. So indicating, yes, it is a cortisol producing tumor. Now this is a very large tumor. This is unlikely to be an adenoma, massive tumor, more than 12 centimeters in size. And uh, it was also vascular. So no adenopathy and no hypertensive crisis during surgery when we operated on her. And of course, the tumor showed evidence of capsular invasion and uh, 
we advise local radiotherapy, which may be a mode of therapy over here. The drug of choice is something called mitotene, uh, which basically concentrates in the adrenal gland and can actually cause destruction of the tumor. Now, mitotene is in fact a derivative of uh, DDT, OPDDD, uh, and uh, is very, very expensive. Even today, it's really expensive. She could not afford it, but touch wood, after seven years, after follow-up on radiation, she's doing pretty well. So let's talk about a broad clinical approach to wind up this talk. When does one investigate for secondary hypertension? So difficult to control with maximal doses. Now we see a lot of people on suboptimal doses of multiple drugs. It's not that. Let's say you're using 20 milligrams of prazosin plus uh, metoprolol 200 milligrams plus uh, cylindropine uh, 20 milligrams per day. A age of presentation less than 30 years. So a shift to the left once again, because in India, uh, we do have a shift to the left for the metabolic syndrome for diabetes and hypertension. Uh, atypical symptoms and signs like recurrent palpitations, weight loss because of catecholamine excess uh, in patients who have fears, periodic paralysis in, in, in uh, patients who have uh, uh, Con syndrome, rarely in Cushing's and in fears you can have hypokalemia as well. Fears due to the uh, catecholamine effect pushing the potassium into the cells. Uh, polyuria in patients who have chronic hypokalemia, you get vacuolar tubular involvement, you can get polyuria, recurrent UTIs and uh, vesicoutral reflux. And of course, vasculitis should be thought about with the other symptoms in addition. Family histories of severe hypertension and renal failure in uh, patients who have uh, adult polycystic kidney disease. And of course, the various femochromocytoma syndromes and as well as the hyperaldosteronism and syndromes and uh, severe presentations of any sort, please investigate for uh, secondary causes. Your examination checklist, uh, please do a, a, a good deep history pedigree chart and do a thorough physical examination. Examine the optic fundus. You have papilledema, it means it's a severe disease or even grade three hypertensive changes. Uh, look for features of MEN2 like marfanoid features, mucocutaneous uh, um, mucosal uh, lesions, features of Turner syndrome in young ladies, and uh, the radiofemoral delay and peripheral pulses, uh, which are important, of course, also for tuchiosis disease. Skin lesions, palpable kidneys, and an abdominal brewing for renal artery stenosis. So in a primary care or a secondary care center, these are the various things that you should be doing, which I'm sure are easy to do. And once you need to refer, these are the tests that will also need to be done, including imaging, isotope scans, vasculitic workup, and of course, when required, a renal biopsy. So once again, acknowledging the entire team from CMC Velo, including our sister departments, and uh, thank you once again for this privilege of letting us give this talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot, sir. That was a very informative lecture in detail. Uh, sir, any questions? Please type in the chat box if any, if you want. Uh, so you mentioned about the atypical symptoms in in our uh, fear from cytomas and varicoclemas. Do we like? Uh, like when we are working in tertiary or rather in a, a secondary hospital, like you may, do we just get away with doing an urine levels alone or do we have to image first in terms of higher imaging? So that's an extremely good question. I think uh, let me first emphasize the fact that uh, the classical symptoms are seen maybe less and less than we have ever thought it used to be. It's only about 50 to 60 percent who have the classical symptoms. There are patients who have persistent hypertension, and there's a good number now who may be relatively normotensive or with just borderline high blood pressures as well. But this and but they may have the symptoms without the high blood pressure at that point of time. So uh, you do get that. So yes, you do the thorough workup, you do the catecholamine levels, and of course, if you're in a center where you don't even have catecholamine, you can even get away with vandal mandelic acid. Fuse are generally bigger lesions. So a sonologist who does a proper ultrasound should be able to pick up a few. Uh, and a CT scan, once again, if you're really 
So expecting something is easily available now across the country. So you could do that also as an early test. Make sure that there's a proper arterial phase on the CT scan, which is being done. Uh, so very often, let's not overkill at times. We have, yeah. have this increasing phenomena of people doing PET scans for everything. And sometimes these PET scans, like our nuclear medicine department tells us, the quality of the PET scans aren't great. Okay. And they may miss more things and actually pick up things which you're looking for. So let's go step by step. And I think at the level of a secondary care center, at least, perhaps you can go up to the level of a CT if you're really suspecting this condition as well. Within the setting of like having a non-specific uh, metanephrine level, like you mentioned earlier, it can be normal and then having yeah. the Now, that once again, that 10% of normal is more something which we would perhaps see. For you to see it, maybe a little less, yeah. less common. Uh, so, yeah, I think it needs a bit of clinical discretion to make that decision over there. One more question, like uh, post-surgery, when you have a complete excision of the tumors, uh, how, how, do we, how do we go about tapering down the anti hypertensives? Yeah, that's also an excellent question. So, after you have had a few with the tumor being removed, in most, in many situations, there is a persistence of hypertension. And why is that happen? Now, for example, if you have a 50-year-old man who has a few, very often there may be coincident uh, systemic hypertension. So that may be one case. The other thing which happens is you've been giving them a lot of salt and water prior to surgery. So they still have a lot of that in their bodies. And so one of the ways of handling that is giving them a diuretic uh, post-operatively. So giving them a bit of uh, you know, loop diuretics for the first uh, five days or a week may in fact bring some of that blood pressure down. Uh, yet another thing is that patients with severe hypertension with fewers may have hypertensive glomerular sclerosis. And in some of these patients, the blood pressure may remit a little bit, but you may be left with residual hypertension, not as severe as before. So the drug of choice there would not be uh, alpha blockade, but would be ACE inhibitors or ARBs in that kind of a situation. Oh, very rarely, you may have residual tumor sitting somewhere else. Now, with the caliber of our endocrine surgeons, I don't expect it to be in the adrenal bed. The issue is whether there has been some metastasis preoperatively, uh, which may or may not have been missed. In most situations, we would have picked it up preoperatively. In some situations, very, very uncommon that we may, uh, may, not, may, may have missed it out. But that is, uh, I would say, exceedingly uncommon. Thanks, sir. There are some comments from the participants. There's, um, and, uh, Dr. Srinivasan has mentioned thanks and excellent and good coverage from former JIPMA Pondicherry Pediatric Department Professor and Head. So I think from JIPMA, do you know him? Yeah, uh, thank you, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions in any case. Thank you. And also a uh, comment from uh, Dr. Jaya Singh, excellent talk, hugely helpful in my work as pediatric radiologist. It's, she says she's so impressed. So, any other comments or any questions? Uh, well, if you can drop, we can drop uh, an email to us in case you have any further questions. And uh, I'm sure if you watch the video once more, you may have yeah. uh, more queries and we'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. This lecture will be soon uploaded in our Department of Medicine YouTube website. So it uh, will be available to all who want to access that. You can subscribe that also. Um, thanks a lot, sir, once again. Thank for you. All this. Thank you.